Thank you. Um, so this first talk is, uh, like Dr. Estep said, about acute decompensated heart failure. I'm going to mainly focus on the recent um, updated guidelines and go over some of the mainstays of goals of therapy and then uh, kind of how we got there, a couple studies, and then a couple methods you can use to prognosticate your patients who are admitted with acute decompensated heart failure. So like I said, uh, the main points of this talk are found in the most recent uh, set of guidelines for management of heart failure, which were updated in 2013. So we'll start out with what is the definition of heart failure? So heart failure, systolic or diastolic, is considered a complex clinical syndrome that results from any structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling or ejection of blood. And with this, you have the cardinal signs and symptoms of dyspnea, fatigue, and fluid retention or volume overload. And I think you know this definition makes an important point that we're concerned both about ventricular filling and ejection of blood. So with that comes, there's actually you know two main groups of patients with heart failure: those who have a reduced or those who have a preserved ejection fraction. So patients with heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. Those are patients that have a clinical diagnosis of heart failure with an ejection fraction of less than 40%. That's in comparison to patients with heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, or HEFPEF, um, which have clinical signs of heart failure with evidence of a preserved EF, a little bit of uh, discussion as to what that means, but in general, an ejection fraction greater than 40 to 50% with evidence of abnormal LV diastolic function. So, you know, why is this important? Mainly because it's a huge issue in cardiology. You guys are on the wards, kind of in the units, seeing how often you're having patients admitted with heart failure. We know that overall, as the population ages, we have an increasing number of these patients. And right now, the lifetime risk of developing heart failure is about 20% for Americans that are over age of 40. There's about 650,000 new cases of heart failure that are diagnosed annually. And over 5 million people in the US have clinical manifestations of heart failure. Despite all the advances that we've had in care, which we'll go over in a few minutes, including with cardiogenic shock and kind of advanced care, our absolute mortality rates remain high, about 50% within five years of diagnosis. It's the primary diagnosis for more than 1 million hospitalizations, and one month readmission rates are about 25%, which as we change kind of how reimbursement rates work um, in hospitals, this is a really important number. What can we do to decrease that readmission rate? And overall, right now, the total cost of heart failure in the US exceeds about $30 billion annually. So just a little bit of review about heart failure classification. We know we have the ACC and AHA stages and also our New York Heart Association cl functional classes. So just to review stage A, these are patients who have a high risk but without actual structural heart disease or symptoms. Stage B, which are patients who have structural heart disease but don't have actual signs and symptoms. Stage C, those are patients who have structural disease and have symptoms, prior or current. Mainly, those are the patients we think about in terms of our NYHA functional classes. And then we have end stage disease, stage D which are patients who are refractory and require special interventions. Those are the ones that we're talking about, durable mechanical support transplant. So what happens in acute decompensated heart failure? So the first thing is we have some type of insult. So you have the setup, then you have an additional insult, which leads to cardiac dysfunction. With that, you have hemodynamic decompensation. So that is threefold, mainly you have increased preload, increased afterload, and decreased cardiac output. The changes in those hemodynamics, they alter your neurohormonal pathways. So you have an increase in your RAS system, an increase in your catecholamines, increase in endothelium. All those lead to increased renal vasoconstriction and fluid retention, and you get this syndrome of fluid overload, which then leads to increased morbidity and mortality. So our goals at treating acute decompensated heart failure are aimed at interrupting these pathways to try to improve our patients. And we all know that you kind of all see that stepwise ladder where you have a patient at a certain point, they have this insult, they decompensate, you try to get them 
improved, back compensated, but they never quite make it back to that level. They, they always continue that stepwise decline and how we can intervene um, to try to get them back. And then as they make that decline down through the stages, how we can reassess what's the next best step for them. So uh, in general, the management aims at uh, four main ideas or points. The first is to identify the triggers. So that can be anything from new ischemia, arrhythmias, worsening valvular disease, uncontrolled hypertension. There's always the issue of noncompliance, dietary or medication noncompliance. And then other things that are a little less common, like significant anemia or thyroid disease. Next is to relieve symptoms. Mostly that uh, focuses on uh, your volume optimization, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then also to pro prognosticate the patients. So they're, you know, you've got them through their acute decompensation. You um, want to see what's the next best step for them. And of course, at every step, you should look at what's their candidacy for goal-directed medical therapy, so ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, aldosterone antagonists, and then device therapy, specifically ICDs or CRT. So one of the mainstays of therapy, it's class one indication level evidence B, is maintenance of goal-directed medical therapy. And so for patients who have been on chronic goal-directed medical therapy, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, ARBs, who have to be required with an acute have to be admitted with an acute decompensation, it is important that they're maintained on these medications unless they have some evidence of hemodynamic instability. So, of course, if they're hypotensive, then you withhold those medications. But otherwise, if they're just volume overloaded, it's important to keep them on these medicines. The other thing to keep in mind is that if they were not chronically on these medications before they come in, once you've reached um, an optimization of their volume status, you should consider initiation of beta blocker therapy. The caveat being that if these patients did require inotrope support during their admission, you want to do this with a little bit more care, maybe lower dose, titrate up slowly. The mainstay of, we all know, our taking care of our patients with acute decompensated heart failure is optimizing their volume status. So as part of the guidelines, that includes prompt treatment with IV loop diuretics. It's a class one level of evidence B uh, recommendation. And the guidelines also note that if the patient's not hypertensive, you can consider additional treatment with IV nitro, nitroprusside, nisirotide to help with that diuresis. The guidelines also mention some class 2B recommendations, such as ultrafiltration, which helps with your volume status, as well as vasopressin antagonists in the set of significant hyponatremia, like the VAPTANs, which can help with your volume optimization. Um, in general, euvolemia is the goal. Um, and that would be euvolemia that you achieve on an oral dose of medication that's been stable through their admission because we all know that if we send patients home before that, they're at a high risk of recurrence and readmission. So it's all about volume status in these patients. So one way that we talk about how to achieve volume status is this trial. You guys are all familiar with it, the DOSE trial. Um, and this, mainly the question was, in these patients with acute decompensated heart failure, how does continuous versus intermittent and low versus high dose diuretic compare? And the main uh, endpoints were a symptom improvement, so kind of subjective improvement with the patients, and then renal function. And the 72-hour mark was their kind of point at which they compared the two. So in the trial design, <clears throat> they took patients with acute heart failure who were on a home Lasix dose greater than 80 milligrams but less than 240 milligrams, and they randomized <clears throat> within 24 hours of admission. And it was a two-by-two two factorial randomization. They had patients with high dose uh, that were placed on continuous infusion, and high dose was considered two and a half times their oral dose, or high dose versus intermittent. And then you also had two other groups, which was low dose, which was just their same as their oral dose as continuous infusion versus that same dose as Q12 bolus. Uh, at 48 hours, they could either change to oral, continue their current dose, or have a 50% increase in their dose. And then at 72 hours, they looked at their primary endpoints, which was a change in the creatinine or their, their subjective measurement of how they were feeling. So 
When we look at the, uh, this is the subjective measurement, continuous versus intermittent, when you compare the two, there really wasn't much of a change in terms of how patients looked at their symptomatology between the two dosing styles. But when you looked at low versus high, there was a trend towards, <clears throat> excuse me, a significant improvement in their symptoms in patients who received the high dose strategy. The other point that uh, they wanted to look at was how that affected your renal function. They specifically looked at the percent change in creatinine greater than 0.3 and at the 72 hour mark. You can see that the low dose versus the high dose, there was an increase, a greater increase in the creatinine, but then that change really disappeared uh, if you went out a few more days. So overall, uh, the secondary endpoints of low versus high, you could see that significantly patients felt with the high dose, they had better symptom improvement. They also had a faster change in their weight with greater volume loss at the expense of some decrease in their renal function. However, that change really was just in the first 72 hours. If he went out a few more days, then there really was no difference. So overall in this study, we saw that the high dose led to better symptom improvement and there was no difference in intermittent versus continuous dosing. So when you have your patients who have come in with acute decompensated heart failure, you want to focus on that 2.5 times their home dose, but whether you decide to do it continuously or intermittently can be kind of your preference. One thing that the, the study uh, also kind of looked at was the rates of death, rehospitalization, or ED visits in these patients, and there really was no significant difference between uh, continuous versus intermittent or high versus low in these rates, which is something that's important to note. So another question that you can sometimes run into is you have these patients with acute decompensated heart failure, you're doing their you know, their, their goal-directed medical therapy, you're trying to optimize their volume status, but you feel you're not really getting anywhere, or the patient to you looks euvolemic, but they're still having continued symptoms, that could be a time that you consider looking at invasive hemodynamics. So specifically in the guidelines, they mention that you should consider doing hemodynamic monitoring with a PA catheter in patients who have impaired perfusion, in whom you can't really assess their intracardiac pressures, or, or who have persistent symptoms despite these standard therapies. And that, that way you can try to help delineate what's really going on and um, adjust your medications appropriately. So um, there are a couple studies that help us prognosticate these patients who are admitted with acute decompensated heart failure. Um, one study is the ADHERE study. Um, basically the results of this show that you can predict a high intermediate or uh, low risk of mortality for your patients who are admitted with acute decompensation just by using some lab values and vital signs at their time of admission. So for this study, they found that uh, the important markers were a BUN, specifically a BUN greater than or, or above um, 43, and then if patients had a systolic blood pressure less than or more than, <clears throat> excuse me, 115. So the patients who had the best, or the lowest, I should say, mortality, they had a BUN less than 43 and a systolic blood pressure of greater than 115, and those patients had about a 2% in, in hospital mortality rate. On the other end of the spectrum, patients who had an elevated BUN greater than 43 in, in addition to a low systolic blood pressure, and then the third marker, an elevated serum creatinine of greater than 2.75, had the greatest in hospital mortality rate of almost 22%. So I think it's important to kind of look at your patient when they're first coming in, everyone kind of looks bad, but exactly how bad is it? And um, you know, how, how much do you really need to worry about their in-hospital mortality? So these are some important markers to keep in mind, BUN, systolic blood pressure, serum creatinine. And then another uh, helpful tool that we all, I think we all have kind of used is the Seattle Heart Failure Score. This was originally developed with over 1,000 heart failure patients, and then they validated their score model in about 9,000 additional patients. And it provides an accurate assessment of one, two, and three year survival. It uses demographic data, labs, uh, what medications they're on, what device therapy they have, other clinical data. <coughs> you can download the calculator, it even has like an app on your phone. You can put in the information on your patient, and then you can even make changes in terms of changing their medications or adding a device therapy, and that allows you to see uh, what effects that would have on their mortality and their outcome. <clears throat>
So overall, I mean, the, when you're taking care of your patients with acute decompensation, you want to remember goal-directed medical therapy, volume optimization, try to prognosticate them when they come in, see what you can do um, to get them back up to their compensated level versus is it time to start talking about more advanced therapies. And then always, you know, think about at every step, are they on the right meds? Is it time for a device? You know, and um, what's the next step for them? So that's all for that. Do you have any questions?